Live from Santa Clara, California, it's theCUBE. Covering Open Networking Summit 2017. Brought to you by the Linux Foundation. Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Frick here with theCUBE. We are at Open Networking Summit. Uh, joined here in this segment by uh, Scott Rainovich, by uh, guest host for the next couple days. Great to see you again, Scott. Good to see you. Uh, and and uh, really excited to have a long time CUBE alumni, many time CUBE alumni, always up to some interesting and innovative <laughs> thing. Sam Greenblatt, he's now, amongst other things, the CTO of Nano, Nano Global. Nano, like, very, very small. Sam, great to see you. Great to see you too, Jeff. So you said before we went offline, you thought you would retire, but there's just too many exciting things going on and it drug you back into this crazy tech that, world. J just when you think you're out, they pull you back in. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what is Nano Global for people that aren't familiar with the company? Uh, Nano Global is a MSLQ, which is the compound, which is a nano compound that basically uh, kills viruses, pathogens, uh, funguses, and it does it by jet attaching itself at the nano level to these microbiome, uh, micro life, and it implodes it. And technically that term is called lysis. That sounds very scary. It's very scary because we tried to sell it as a hand uh, processing. You just told me it kills everything. I don't yeah. want to put that on my hand, Sam. Uh, no, it's good that it kills some of the good bacteria, but it, it basically protects you for 24 hours. You never have, you don't have to reapply it. You can wash your hands. It's like you become Superman or something. Yeah. Absolutely, I, I literally use it to wash off the tr trays in the planes and the armrests while the guy next to me is sneezing like crazy to try to kill any airborne pathogens. So what about the nanotechnologies got you uh, traveling up to Santa Clara today for? Um... Well, what I'm doing is, one of the things we're working on, besides that, is we're working on genomics. And I work uh, with some other companies on genomics besides nano. And genomics has me totally fascinated. When I was at Dell, I went to uh, ASU and for the first time I saw pediatric genomics being uh, processed quickly and that was in a day. Today, a day is unheard of. It's terrible. You want to do it in less than an hour. And I was fascinated by how many people can be affected by the use of genomic medicine and ge genomic pharmacology. And uh, you know, you see some of the ads on TV like Optiva, that's a genomic medicine. It attacks a genomic irregularity in your DNA. So it's amazing. And the other thing I'm very interested in is eradicating in my lifetime, which I don't know if it's going to happen, cancer. And how you do that is very simple. Um, they found the chemotherapy is interesting, but not fascinating. It doesn't always work. But what they're finding is if they can find enough biometric information from your genomes, from your proteomics, from your RNA, they can literally customize, it's called precision medicine, a specific uh, medicine track for you to uh, actually uh, fight the cancer successfully. Uh, it, it, I, I, I can't wait for the day, and hopefully it will be in your lifetime, when, when they look back at today, cancer treatments and said, now what did you do again? You gave them as much <laughs> poison as they could take, right up to the time they almost died, and hopefully the cancer died I'll first. I'll tell you the... It's like bloodletting, I mean, it's, it, yeah, yeah. you know, it will it, not be that long from now that we look back at this time and say, that was just archaic, which is It's called good. reactive medicine. Um, it's funny, there's a story that the guy who actually did the sequencing of the DNA, uh, the original DNA strand tells, that when he was younger, he basically were able to see 
his chromosomes and then he was able to get down to the DNA and to the proteins and he could see that he had an irregularity that was known for uh, basically uh, cancer. And he went to the doctor and said, I think I have cancer of the pancreas. And the guy said, your, uh, your blood tests don't show it. And by the way, you don't get that blood test until you're over 40 years old, PS1, the PS scan. And what happened was they actually found out that he had cancer of the pancreas. So, yeah, that, it's, pr it's predictive, isn't it? So, yes, like, totally. You, basically, what you're doing is you're you're data mining the, the human and the human genome, and trying to do some sort of. Uh, We're not doing the 23andMe, yeah. which tells you you have a propensity right, to be right, fat. Right. But, but tell, walk us through what you're doing. You're obviously <laughs> you're here at a you're here at an IT cloud conference. So you're obviously using cloud technologies Absolutely. to help accelerate the discovery of medicine. So, so walk us through okay. how you're doing that. What happens is when you get the swab or the blood and your DNA is then processed, it comes in and it gets cut to how many literal um, samples that they need. They use 30, 23 and me uses the 30X, that's 30 pieces. Uh, today, uh, that's 80, uh, by the way, gigabytes of data. Uh, if you were to take a 50X is what you need for cancer, which is probably low, but it's, that takes you up to 150 gigabytes per person. Now think about the fact you got to capture that, then you got to capture the RNA of the person, you got to capture his biometrics, and you got to capture his uh, electronic medical record, and all the uh, radiology that's done. And you got to bring it together, look at it, and determine what they should do. And the problem is the oncologic doctors today are scared to death of this because they know how, if you have this, I'm going to take you in and basically do some radiation. I'm going to do chemotherapy on you and, and, and run the course. What's happening is when you do all this, you've got to correlate all this data. It's probably the world's largest big data outside of YouTube. Uh, it's number two in number of bytes. And we haven't sequenced everybody in the planet. Everybody should get sequenced. It should be stored, and then when you get, that's called a germline, you're healthy. Mm -hmm. Then you take the cancer, and you look at the germline and compare it. And then you're able to see what the difference is. Now, open source has great technology to deal with this flood of data. Uh, LinkedIn, as you know, open source, Kakafa, and one of the things that's great about that is it's a pull model. It's a producer, broker, um, subscriber model. And, this, and you can open up multiple channels. And by opening up multiple channels, since the subscribers are doing the pull instead of trying to send it all and overflow it, and we all know what it's like to overflow a pipe. It goes everywhere. But doing it through a Kakafa model or a NIFI model, which is, by the way, donated by the NSA. We're not going to unmask who donated it, but no, I'm only <laughs> kidding. But uh, the NSA donated it. And data flows now become absolutely critical because as you get these segments of DNA, you got to send it all down. Then what you got to do is do, and you're going to love this, a hidden Markovian chain and put it all back together. Oh, yes. So you can match the pattern. And then once you match the pattern, then you got to do a quality control to see whether or not you screwed it up. And then beyond that, you then have to do something called Smith-Waterman, which is a QC time. And then you can give it to somebody 
to figure out where the variant is. The mm -hmm. whole key is all three of us share 99.9% .9 of the same DNA. That one percent, tenth of a percent, is what is a variant. The variant is what causes all the diseases. We're all born with cancer. You have cancer in you, I have it, Jeff has it. And the only difference between a healthy person and a sick person is your killer cell went to sleep and doesn't attack the cancer. The only way to attack cancer is not chemotherapy, and I know every oncologic person who sees this is gonna have a heart attack. It's basically let your immune system fight it. So what this tech does is it moves all that massive data into the variant. Once you get the variant, then you gotta look at the RNA and see if there's variants there. Then you gotta look at the radiology, the germline, and the biometric data. And once you get that, you can make a decision. I'll give you the guy who's my hero in this is a guy named Dr. Shun. He's the guy who came up with the broxane. A broxane is for pancre uh, pancreas. Who's he with now? Nat Health. Oh. <laughs> and why I, he discovered, he knew all about medicine, but he didn't know anything about technology. Mm -hmm. So then this becomes probably the best machine learning issue that you can have because you have all this data, you're gonna learn what it works on patients and you're gonna get all the records back. So what I'm gonna talk about, because they wanted to talk of using um, SDN, using NFV, opening up hundreds of channels, right from uh, source to, uh, from provider to the uh, subscriber or consumer, as they call it, with the broker in the middle, and moving that data, then getting it over there and doing the processing fast enough that it can be done while the patient still hasn't had any other problems. Mm -hmm. And so I have great charts of what the genome looks like. I sent it to you. Yeah. So it's clear these these two fields are going to continue to, to merge in you know, bioinformatics as and, fast and as IT possible. cloud, and we just plug our plug our brain and our bodies into the health cloud, and it tells us what's, it, what's up. Exactly. It, <laughs> uh, Ginny was here. Ginny Rometty from IBM. She would tell you that quantum. She just announced the first commercially available quantum computer. Her first use for it is genomics because genomics is a very repetitive repetitive process that is done in parallel remember you just cut this thing into 50 pieces you put it back together and now you're looking to see what's hidden and it doesn't look like it's normal if you looked at my uh, my genetics one of the things you notice that i will not consume a lot of caffeine and how they know that is because there's a set of chromosomes in my 23 chromosomes that basically says I won't consume it. Consume it. Turns out to be totally wrong <laughs> because my behavioral overrode the, the <laughs> DNA. But what the Linux Foundation was interesting is everybody here wants to talk about, are, the, are we gonna use um, this technology or that technology, what they want is an application using the technology and non-health that I talked about can transport a terabyte, a terabit of data virtually. In other words, it's not really doing it, but it's doing it through multiple sources and multiple um, consumers. And that's what people are fascinated by. All right, well, like I said, Sammy gets into the, uh, <laughs> into the wild and woolly ways and exciting new things. So, sounds great and uh, you know, a, a very bright future on the healthcare side.
it's, thanks for uh, thank stopping by. Thank you very much. I hope I didn't bore you with No, no, no. <laughs> Good stuff. We don't want more chemotherapy, so that's definitely better to have less chemotherapy and more genetic fixing of sickness. So, okay. Sam, thanks. great to see you again. Thanks, thanks for stopping so. by. Thank you Scott very Rainovitz, much. Scott Rainovich, Jeff Frick, you're watching The Cube from Open Networking Summit in Santa Clara. We'll be back after this short break. Thanks for watching. Robert Hershevik. People obviously 